All right, if you want to make your way, uh, kind of make your way back to your chair or somebody else's chair, whatever you'd like to do, that's all right. Well, I uh, first thing, I, and I wasn't going to say this, um, di well, didn't know this was going to happen, but I got to tell you, most of you all missed, uh, uh, to me, the best part of that uh, music worship time. Most of you missed it. Because... Um, and I wouldn't say this if she was still here. I wouldn't want to embarrass her. But one of our uh, youngest uh, participants um, was up here, and she was um, signing the uh, words to the songs. When she was talking about Christ in me, Christ in me, uh, the hope of glory, this... Uh, and, and it just made me think, it was really cool. I, I mean, don't get me wrong, I was singing, I was worshiping. I was, I was good with that. But uh, it just, wow, I, truly, it gave me goosebumps. Look, there's one right there. <laughs> and uh, no, it really did because it was really cool because it made me um, think, it reminded me that what we're trying to do on Sunday morning, listen, we, we are not here to entertain you with music, media, message. We're not here to you know, to try and be the best uh, church on the block or anything. We're really not. What we're trying to do on a Sunday morning is you come on Sunday morning and hope that you get something infused in you, some, some bit of scripture, some bit of song, some bit of media, you know, just something just tucked away in your heart and your mind uh, that can, that can um, encourage you, guide you, strengthen you throughout, throughout the week. And so, I, what it made me think of this this young this young uh, part of our body here. She was she was she was and and I don't and I'm not pretending like she understood all the words any more than we do. But there was something that was um, infused in her that she was enjoying this at this young age, and I thought, that's, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to embed something in the kids that mean something then, and then when they get to be this age, the teenage, we're, we're, we're trying to continue to embed something in them that will, that will get them through hard decisions, choices, temptations, and then, and then when they get to be your age and some of you are past that age. We, we try to get embed something in you. And truth be told, we're trying, to, we're trying to embed a little bit of the life of Christ. And, and it begins really like in that room, the nursery. And then, uh, and I just say this uh, really authentically, to try and embed something in you that if I'm still here someday down the road and you leave this earthly presence, we, we can say at your funeral time, something good was embedded in them. And they understood Christ in me, Christ in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Really, I thought of all that when I was just watching her sign those words. It, none of that's written down here on this 98-page message. <laughs> I just, it just reminded me, that's what we're trying to do, embed something in you so that you have just this little bit of joy in the middle of some hard things. Some of you got some hard things. And if you don't right now, you know, right? Wait a few days. But if we can, if we can help her as she grows into teen, as she grows into an adult, Nah, there's hope for the rest of us. You understand what I mean? Okay. 
Uh, would you stand if you can? I uh, just want to offer a word of prayer to so get into uh, really the message. God, thank you for uh, this young child teaching us something. Thank you for the music team and, and all their preparations and plans and, and all their work and rehearsals just for, that, for, for those brief moments leading us toward you, this, this hope of glory. And I pray that you would hide me in your shadow for these few moments, God, that um, what I say, how I say it would honor you and you'd be pleased. Um, and, and what would be heard um, through, through our spirit, through our, through our soul, in the depth of our soul, would be really your guidance and your challenge uh, for each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Um, this, uh, this slide that you see up here is uh, Power Lines. That's the... That's the title for this really brief series that I'm going to revisit later on a couple of months. But power line simply is that the, the idea that no matter how dark it gets, that there are certain passages of scripture, certain truths of scripture that can infuse some light and some energy into our lives. Now, we know we're not supposed to elevate certain passages of Scripture above certain passages of Scripture, you know, all inspired and all that kind of thing. But truth be told, we all have some favorite passages or, or stories that, that, that can give us some energy, can, can encourage us, can challenge us, maybe can correct a choice that we are making. And so the idea, again, just take a look at the graphic up on the slide. The idea, again, is that no matter how dark the, uh, the way looks, no matter how, how kind of uh, scary and, and unsure the path looks, that, that there are some powerful lines of truth in Scripture that can light up your landscape and infuse some energy into your life. And one of those comes out of Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 uh, through 30. They'll put that up on the screen. Let me just read it to you. Matthew 28, 11 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We don't do this very often, but I'm going to ask you would, you, would you mind, let's just read that out loud together. Just read it so you hear it in your own head, and then I'm just going to talk about it a little bit, okay? Can we read that together? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. It begins with, come to me. Jesus speaking these words to people like us, that sometimes life is going really well, and sometimes life is going less been really well. And he starts out with three words that are the linchpin of this whole truth. Come to me. The fact of the matter is that we get a lot of invitations in life. We are invited to parties, to graduations, to weddings. We're invited out to dinner. But the one thing that I want you to capture from this particular passage, these couple of verses, is the truth that rest, R-E-S-T, rest is a bigger deal in Scripture than we give it credit for. We know that it's one of the top ten commands, Old Testament, Exodus. Keep the Sabbath holy. You should rest on the Sabbath because God rested on the Sabbath. Now, we know we don't need to be legalistic about it and make that Sabbath Sunday. But we also need to remember that when God places something in the top 10, it might be important. And Jesus here explains that a little more deeply because he says, if you want a deep rest, 
If you want a meaningful Sabbath, where do you begin? Three words. Come to me. In Exodus chapter 31, verse 17, it says the seventh day is to be a day of rest. Leviticus 25, verse 5. I love this passage because it's so accurate. Leviticus 25, verse 5 says, even the land on which you farm must have a Sabbath. The land must lay fallow. Now, if you know anything about gardening, planting, and all this kind of thing, you know that when the land is laying fallow, this is really important, that when the earth is laying fallow, when it's, when it's not being plowed, when it's not being tilled, it looks like there is nothing going on in that land. But truth be told, beneath the surface, a whole lot is going on. Rejuvenation is taking place. The reason you don't plant your crops in a section of land time and 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 time, and time just con continue on again, because it sucks all the nutrients, all the life out of that land. And even Leviticus is saying, listen, if the land needs to lay fallow periodically, if the land needs to be rested periodically to rejuvenate, to get nourishment, to get nutrients, to be brought back to life, then surely beneath our surface there is some rejuvenation and nourishment that needs to take place. The results when we seek rest come to me. The results often happen below the surface of our lives and people might not even see it. People might not know that it's going on, but you and I know that when we take time to come to Christ, when we take time to seek God's will for our lives, more than just God, I hope I have a good day today, hope I don't mess anything up, see you later. But when we take some moments throughout the day and we just allow our lives to lay fallow, there is a deep rest. Psalm 62, 11, a great little verse. It says this, my soul finds rest in God alone. My soul finds rest in in God alone. We know that we can find rest in different ways. For example, I find great rest when I am at the beach. The beach is the most restful place for me. None of you have a condo on the beach anywhere, do you? <laughs> Just thought I'd ask. We'll erase that from the CD later. Where is your restful place? How do you get rejuvenated beneath the surface? Truth be told, for me, um, one of the places where I get rejuvenated beneath the surface is time of exercise. One of the places that I get rejuvenated beneath the surface is just having dinner with really good friends. One of the places that I get rejuvenated beneath the surface is listening to a variety of music. How do you get rejuvenated? But truth be told, all of those ways which are good and helpful pale in comparison to the three words on the screen. Come to me. Because if I am centered in Christ, the dinner with friends is even better. 
because I'm healthier. If I'm centered in Christ, then it's not just about me on the beach and the ocean. It's about this huge creation that God has laid out before me. If I'm centered in Christ, then the music takes on a different tone and quality, and I recognize, what would this world be without music, art, and creativity? Can you imagine the blandness? And God doesn't want life to be bland. If there's anything that I want you to gather this morning, it's the idea that within these two verses are just two parallel truths. To find a deep soul level rest, you have to know these two parallel truths. And I highlight them a little bit on the next couple slides. So take a look at this next slide. The first truth in this particular passage, these two verses is that Jesus is giving an invitation. Jesus is giving an invitation. Come to me. Take my yoke. Learn from me. Jesus is being very centered on himself. If you want to find some rest and deep peace, if you want some healthiness, if you want your life to have meaning, if you want to break through and break away from the temptations, if you want to have deeper relationships with people, it is all about accepting this invitation. If you want your sins forgiven, if you want something going on beneath your life when it's laying fallow. If you want that marriage to regain a little more of the hope, if you want to deal with a little more deeply the results that the doctor has given that are not what you had hoped for, if you want to move past being a depressed person and just simply recognizing that I may have some depressed tendencies, but I am a child of God. If you want to move into a place of hope, accept the invitation. A yoke, some of you know a yoke is what brings two um, animals together to do the work together, usually yoke together cattle and plowing and you know that imagery and Jesus talks a lot about imagery. What he's just simply saying is yoke up with me. How we would say it today, how would we say it today? Link arms together. Just link arms with me. When you stumble, I'll be holding on. When you tend to veer off in a different direction, don't worry, I'll, I'll pull you back. And when life is really hard, well, we're linked together, so I'll help you get through it. It is when we don't accept the invitation or when we only on the surface accept the invitation and say, okay, Jesus, I want to be a part of life with you, um, but, you know, there are some things I need to do on my own. Why? Why? Why are there some times when we drop our arm and we're no longer linked together? Why? It's because we forget the second key to this passage. Next slide. Jesus not only gives us his invitation, he gives us his involvement in our life. There is not an aspect of your life that he doesn't want to be involved in. There are no mundane pieces of your life that he says, well, you go ahead and take care of that. I'm really not interested in that. Jesus seeks to be involved in every area of your life. That's why he says, come to me. 
Let's link arms together. Let's join in this process as a team because I want to be involved in your everyday world. Finding rest is not the hardest thing. Finding a deep rest, what he calls a soul rest, is elusive, impossible, if you are not linked arms with the one who can give it. Have you linked arms with Jesus Christ today? Have you linked arms with him in the past, but kind of the linkage has gotten a little weak and you've kind of let go because of frustration, because of doubt, because of anger, because of some past sin, because of your flat-out stubbornness? <laughs> some of us are flat-out stubborn. Should I point to you? I'm going to point to a stubborn person. Are you ready? Who? And every one of you know you could do the same. Every one of us know that there are times when we want to live on the surface of faith instead of facing the doubter in the mirror. But you know what? You have to want this. I, 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 wish, I wish it could be like easier and more convenient, but you have to really want this kind of deep rest. Your friends all around you can invite you out when you are struggling with wounds or depression or anger or something's going on and people can say, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? And people all around us will do that, right? How can I help? What can I do? What's the deal, though? The deal is we have to accept that kind of help. We have to be willing to say yes. Yes to the invitation. People can give us invitations all the time, but it really doesn't matter until we say yes to one of the invitations. There's this great story, and I'm going to skim through it a little bit. In 1 Kings 19, take a look at the next slide. 1 Kings 19 is about Elijah. In uh, Elijah... Uh, Old Testament prophet, it is this great story. And I'll tell you what, I'm not going to like read the whole uh, chapter, but I really encourage you to take a look at 1 Kings 19 sometime in the story of Elijah. Here's this is a quick summary piece of it. Elijah was a prophet. He was a good prophet. He was a strong prophet. He stood up for God most of the time. As a matter of fact, he stood up for God so often that he got in a lot of trouble. And at one time, Elijah went into a town and just like wiped out, him and his men, like wiped out all of these uh, competing prophets, all these pagan gods and tore down uh, their altars and so on. And he did, you know, just like, like this non-politically correct thing. He said, God's the only God and the gods you're worshiping just didn't worth squat, so we're just going to just take them on down. Well... There are people who don't, don't, don't like that kind of thing. And so Elijah got in a little trouble with a woman named Jezebel. You heard of her? Oh, yeah. Well, Jezebel says, you tell Elijah, may the gods deal with me very severely if by this time tomorrow I do not take your life. That was his telegram. So what did Elijah do? Elijah stood up and ran for the hills. That's what you do when you're confronted, right? That's what I do when I'm confronted sometime. So Elijah, 1 Kings 19, verse 3, just picking up the story a little bit. Elijah was afraid. He ran for his life when he came to Beersheba, just a town, in Judah, he left his servant there and went with himself another day journey into the desert. 
Elijah left the only person standing there with him and said, you wait here, I'm going to go into the desert. (laughs) What kind of knucklehead thing is that? I'm going to leave my one companion behind and I'm going to go into the desert. The desert is not the place you go for happy thoughts. The desert represents dead. But Elijah wanted to get away. Don't you do this sometime? Something's going wrong, something's going downhill, things are not really happy in your life. What's the first thing you do? Get people away from me. What's the second thing you do? Hold yourself up. You go into your own desert. He came to a tree, he sat down under the tree, and he prayed this prayer. Remember, this is Elijah, the big guy. He stood up for God. He wiped out the other prophets. He took down all the altars. This is what Elijah prays. After one threat, Lord, I have had enough. Kill me now. I'm no better than my ancestors. He said, you know, I'm really not better than those other bum prophets that came before me. I'm tired. I'm being threatened. I think I'm done. And he laid down under a tree and he fell asleep. I understand this. I get this. A couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, something, we're talking to some people about church and life and all this other kind of thing. And nothing was really bad going on. I mean, it's just kind of normal, you know, life. And just like you got normal life. And we're having this conversation about, you know, Jesus coming again and the end time and this other sort of thing. You know, normal dinner conversation. And I said, you know what? I think, I think it's time. I think I'm done. I think it's time for him to come back. Clearly, he didn't listen. Or we're all in trouble (laughs) and we're here. (laughs) But in your life, don't you periodically just say, you know, I, okay, okay, I'm done with you. Don't you say that to people sometimes? All right, I'm done. I'm, I'm, that's it. Elijah was just so burned out, he was just done. So frustrated, so sad. So he lays down under the tree, falls asleep all at once. An angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around. There was some bread, a cake a, 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 by his head. There was a cake of bread baked over hot coals, a jar, a jar of water. <laughs> I, you know, I would have asked for something a little better than that. But he ate, he drank, he lay down and went to sleep again. Then the angel of the Lord came back a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat. The journey is too much for you. If you're reading in the Bible or you're reading on an app or something like, underline those words. The angel is saying to him, listen, this is a hard journey you're on. It is too much for you. That's what Jesus is saying in this passage. Sometimes life is just too much for you. So, what's the first three words? Come to me. The journey is too much for you. So he got up, he drank, and strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night. Clearly he is not healed yet. He's had a couple of pieces of bread, some water, and he's still wandering off for the next 40 days and goes into a cave. Going into a cave is not a place you go for happy thoughts. You've gone from the desert into the cave. The word of the Lord came to Elijah. What are you doing here, Elijah? Do you ever have God say that to you in kind of a whisper? What are you doing? Could be in the middle of doing something you know you shouldn't be doing. 
Could be in the middle of looking something you know you should not shouldn't be looking at. Could be in the middle of an argument and you know this word is about to come out and you know you shouldn't ought to say that word, but you're going to say it anyway. I mean, doesn't periodically God say to you, what are you doing? What are you doing, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for you, Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've broken down your altars. They've put the prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. There you have it. There you have the mantra of human beings. What did he say? All these other people are bums. I'm the only one left that's faithful, so take me home. All these other people aren't contributing as much as I am. All these people aren't giving money like I am. All these other people aren't working like I am. All these other people don't struggle as much as I do. All these other people, they don't understand my life. All these other people don't get it. I'm the only one left now. They're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind. Some of you know this story. I'm getting to a little passage that you might have heard before. Then a great and powerful wind tore through the mountains and tore apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord wasn't in the wind. Somebody's being reminded of something. <laughs> and after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he went out. Guess what? I'm not going to finish the story because that's the part I wanted you to catch. What just happened? <clears throat> Elijah says, my life really stinks right now. And so God sends the pyrotechnics. <laughs> he sends the fireworks. He sends the water and he sends all the big stuff that we ask for. God, would you just write it in the sky? Would you, would you just get over all the subtle stuff? But where does God communicate? In the gentle whisper, the still small voice. Here's what you need to leave. Here's what you need to leave here with. You have to want to hear a whisper. You have to lean into a whisper. If God is going to knock boulders down, you'll hear it. If God's going to send a fire, you'll see it. If God's going to do all that stuff in your life, you'll get it. But most of the time, God is just going to calmly, gently guide you and say, You have to want to hear a whisper. If you don't want to hear it, you're not going to hear it. If you're looking for the rocks, the fire, the flood, maybe God will give that to you. But how is that working so far? Isn't most of the time God just trying to give you whispers of something for which you need to respond. And in our verse this morning, isn't the whisper, come to me. I mean, do you really hear Jesus saying those verses, shouting them? 
Or don't you hear Jesus saying, if you want this deep rest, if you want a life of depth and meaning, come to me. I'll give you deep rest. A couple more thoughts, and then I'm going to give you the opportunity to come to him. On this next slide, just simply the verse again. Come to me. Take my yoke. Learn of me. Find rest in me. All of it is Christ-centered. None of it is on the fence. None of it is equivocation. None of it can you take and leave the rest. All of this kind of rest, all of this depth, all of this strength, all of this guidance that we need and really in the recesses of our heart really want is found Come to me. Come to me, he says. Last slide. Just highlighted some of the words. Come to me. Learn. Find rest. Come to me. Learn. Find rest. I heard this great story. I'll just shorten it a bit. About this young man who was raised on a farm just way out, away from the little town that they lived near. He hadn't experienced much of life. He was just like in his mid-teens, and he heard. He heard somehow that the, the, the circus was coming to town. He'd never seen a circus. He'd never... It's, but, but he'd always kind of thought it would be really neat. And so, he, you know, he asked his father, he said, you know, could I, could I just have this one day off, go into town, to go to the circus? And his father, sure, it's going to cost $5. Can we do, well, you know, you work really hard. You, you work hard, yes. I will give you this $5. So his dad just gives him this brand new $5 bill, just place in his hand. And this is a, this old country boy. He just, just doesn't know, you know, he's just, just a good guy. He gets in the old car and he drives the seven miles into town, just so excited. The circus, it's, it's just going to be awesome. I've just heard about this in my life. I've heard about this so long. He gets into town, and just as he gets into town, the circus, as you may know, when a circus comes to town, usually they'll like do this parade, right? They'll parade the animals down the street and the jugglers and the guys walking on stilts and all this stuff. And he gets into this little town. He parks his car, and he, here comes down, really, down the street, just all these, all these animals and jugglers and clowns. And his eyes, ah, this is so cool. This is just <laughs> awesome. And the clown is walking around and juggling and doing some stuff. And the clown, one of the clowns, happens to come over and just stands next to him and just looks at him and gives him a big smile. And this boy pulls his $5 bill out of his pocket <laughs> and he hands it to the clown. The clown assumed he was just, you know, just giving him this $5 because, man, this is so cool. This is so cool. So the clown just takes the $5 and goes on and juggles and the rest of the animals and all this stuff passes by. And the kid gets back in his car and drives home. <laughs> he 
It was only quite some time later he realized he had just seen the parade. He hadn't been to the circus. He thought that was the circus. He missed it. Some of you have been going to the parade of church for years. Some of you have been going and coming and, and the parade and they pass this bag and, well, you put something in and then you sing some songs and you go on. And, 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 and I got to tell you, friends, uh, Sunday morning, this is just the parade. That boy never got into the tent. Some of you have never been in the tent. You've been to so many parades, you've confused the parade with the tent. Don't do that. Come to me, he said. Come to me. The parades, it's fun. It's good. Sunday mornings, I tell people, they ask about our service. I say, well, we're really just the 3M church. Sunday morning, we're just like 3Ms. What? 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 I say, well, we do media music message. I say, really, that's what we are. You know, we media, try to be creative and try to do drama or something on the screen and try to point to whatever the teaching's going to be and the music and they're practicing and rehearsing and they're trying to do good stuff and they bring us in and they try to do the message and we try to do this message and, you know, you can kind of get lost and you think, well, okay, so music, media, message. That's the big M. If you think that, you're only at the parade. The music, the media, the message, good stuff. Very important. But it's just trying to get you into the tent. No matter how good I am or am not, no matter how good the music is or music not, no matter how wonderful message is or message not, no matter what we do building life, so all, all, all that's really to try and get you into the tent. So, so because, because Jesus is in the tent and, he, and, and, he, and he's just really saying three words. What's he saying? Come to me. So, um, that's what we're going to just provide you the opportunity to do this morning for a few minutes. Let me tell you where we're going. Some churches will give an invitation, some call it an altar call. Some churches will do that um, every week and think that's a big deal. It's not. The big deal is that Jesus gives you an invitation every moment. That's the big deal. The big deal, he is constantly saying, come to me. I, I know you're struggling with this or that. I, I know you're unsure of what you should do about that situation. I know that this, come to me, learn from me. Let's yoke together. Let's get some rest and then get back out there in it. Jesus gives these constant come to me's because at any moment, many moments, we might need some kind of deep rest, deep guidance, deep hope. So, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to just uh, bow your heads, close your eye, and just reflect on maybe something that I've said or something in the scripture, something in one of the songs, wherever you, wherever, wherever the spirit of God takes you in prayer, just go there knowing he's just saying, come to me. And after a, a few moments of that silent 
prayer and your eyes closed, after just a couple of minutes, you're going to hear a song start. And that song will actually be from a video that we're going to show you during that time. And encourage you just to look up and hear the music, listen, listen to the words. But here's the point. You see up front here a couple of areas with some, with some candles and, 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 and places for prayer. I am encouraging any and all of you that need to hear that voice for the first time come to me or hear it for the thousandth time come to me. Nobody's watching who's coming. Nobody's watching what's going on. Nobody, it's, you, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's you and a prayer and a candle, and maybe you, maybe you come with somebody that you need to pray with. Maybe you, you come by yourself because you know you're not by yourself. And you just, you just take the candle laying down here and you light it on this one, and, and then you just light one of these candles and, and please blow that one out before you lay it back down. <laughs> and just spend a minute in prayer and, and just realize that the light of the world is saying to you, Come to me. And then I will, I will come back up and just, and just close in prayer after a few moments. Last thought. What I'm trying to do this morning, what we as a team are trying to do this morning is really in, 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 in captured in, in a song um, called The Heart of Worship. You may or may not know the song, and that's okay, but here is a part of that song. When the music fades and all is stripped away, I simply come. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Jesus. I encourage you to, during the video, come forward for prayer, come forward to light a candle, pray with another person, whatever you feel led to do, or perhaps just come forward and hear the voice in your head, the whisper of God, come to me. Come to me. Will you please bow your head? And close your eyes.
when the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come because he said, come to me in a whisper. Coming back to the heart of worship It's not about the media, music, or message. Coming back to the heart of worship is about you deciding to follow Jesus really. Coming back to the heart of worship is about new song. Choosing to follow Jesus really. It is the maturing of our soul that he seeks. It is the healing of our wounds that he wants to do. It is the taking and the lifting of our burdens that he can do. But only if we let that light of Christ stand within us. I'll conclude in prayer and we will leave the house lights down. You are certainly welcome to stay and pray. And I know some of you need to get some kids and you need to go and that's fine. My real prayer is that sometime soon you will want to hear the whisper. You must want to hear a whisper. And the whisper is just three words. Come to me. Come to me. Lord Jesus, help us to respond individually authentically, deeply, and faithfully to the whisper of your voice. Help us to come to you.